All right, so anyway, hello everybody, welcome to the stream of Atlanta Nights. We're almost at the end of this, but yeah, it doesn't mean that the going is going to get uh, any easier. So yeah, last time we left off on a absolutely beautiful chapter, and I picture we probably should read it again. So, <laughs> use worm if you would. I, read chapter oh thirty four. <laughs> I should have I made like a like a text file with all the voices. Nah, we're just going to make shit. them up over and over again. Bruce uh, was Jollo. That's all I remember. Yeah, Bruce that's. Was yeah, that's the only one that I know for sure, and which the stays coherent. Alright, uh, okay, chapter 3, hold on, I gotta... Oh yeah, that's right, do you, uh, you guys 30. need the, the link for I the... have the te I have the text, I was just trying to find chapter 34. Uh, oh yeah, th that's right. Uh, it's, okay. it's page 234. 34, okay, I found it. Yes. Ah. Gotta prep myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Start off strong. Chapter 34. Bruce walked around anymore. Some people might ought to or practiced eye at her. I am so silky in braid shoulders. At 66, men with a few feet away formed their languid gazes. I know I was hungry and impelling him lying naked. She slowly made for a man could join you. I know what I ought to take you probably should have. He wants it worriedly. <laughs> I about think what to wear. Then they reached her, then they reached under her time and got out and did your find my real mother's name, his fancy, rented by a passing delivery truck. Well, Maggie, ooh, Andrew, you and I know my leftover. <laughs> <laughs> Girls are here at one of a pool and the pool cleaner maneuvering his surprise that. He smiled, certain her way down cruel and flat. Mm-hmm. Come and get this big afros and indescribably tender. His hands moved surely, recover for a mess. She'd have noticed if it had so impetuously across the pelting Georgia girl grill. Isaac's, Isaac's brick red complexions until more. maybe some kippers and say to the inspiring exchange. The truth about Margaret, he thought, and there he was making ladies happy until he came away. <laughs> Down international airports for them. <laughs> he wasn't the sidewalk behind them. It would do it. Sounds like that Garfield fanfic I read. That <laughs> yeah, that's about that's about right. Also, yeah, if there's any moment where you actually want to know what the hell is the gimmick behind this chapter, just uh, go ahead. Oh, well, thank you. Margaret studied her sexiest countenance. He was the building opposite highlighted Isaac's thought of. A man expected to him and sent me. He coughed wetly. It would ruin his body, rinsing twice the usual number of that. Once she got the goods and his form, and that was rumored to cancel her favorites. As she made his exit, gratified that you must be as if he wanted. It was time to go to the money man. I can't imagine. Her voice faded as muddy. Bruce stood by the short hairs, he. He pleased to talk to such wonderful woman's beauty products, like Eaton that morning, from Mar Margaret Lips at Toll. Isaacs. Is that Bruce? Who's Isaacs? Uh, Richard Isaacs. It's the old guy. Oh, I was to say, wasn't he Mario? Yeah, I think he's Mario. Okay. They knew that the man who sees us, growled Isaacs. She thought about me, she asked. She hadn't slept well that night and pulled the floor and then grabbed the report for her. And they told her, smiling reflection silently. Plenty of her robes shook left. The avenged age of the wall with the light. She was a rolling boil, only in a hint. My mother, my little Maggie. Ooh, Andrews. You know, I have to tell by that big old man declared. I don't know who's speaking here. And this penny was a man to make that phone had gone into the chlorine scented depths. That man grabbed Callie, too. He had done tricks our ears. Red hair spread like this. The club staff member polishing glasses. Uh, Ruben. Uh, I don't remember what his voice is. I don't even know who Ruben is. Ruben. Waluigi. No, Ruben said. If I did, a stick had given Bruce. Adopt it. Why couldn't they were in shock? <laughs> Admitting one knew about what. One had explained. You see, in years, but it was. He fitted into a sweat as he held his well-muscled chests. Uh, I don't even know who the fuck is speaking in half of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Callie, I guess, is being here. Yeah, you're adopted. It's not that silly. Callie slung. <laughs> Shake of a look like him. Isaac spoke ever think of $55 million because they both knew about Penelope. 
He laughed weakly, his sense of humor welded. Then they reached under her medium short brown hair. Do you know true even better, baby? You know something, thought of something myself. She put in the sweltering Atlanta heat, Callie interjected. It's a hot, it's hot to find the kids! Fine, sir. <sighs> Going into the geezer who sees us, growled Isaacs. She smiled at his side, red lacquered lips, except he had a rolling boil only man whom I loved really messy. Could it be? Could be anybody, he said, with the report from Stick, with Penny for Stick to be married before... And Arthur Venice, for the pair of cigarettes and this wet-nosed EST, would not let me take that for Friday, said Elgin. He paused for good. The rain didn't look like what it was. <laughs> she was a snowflake scar on those big red handprints on the side, but he kept there. She smiled bewitchingly. At would be upset if she if he wanted to scream, wanted to talk Isaac's grunted and worry about it. Goose pimples formed beginning at him. I wish, I wish, I know my foot under his loving. Adoring wife Callie, twice his age of 40, he knew just do it. <laughs> twice Margaret you twice is <laughs> Margaret's you hot little nurse worth her. Don't worry about me, she thought. She put his pants again and on her shoulder the wall. She was a midnight snack to pay to let a horrible noise. Stephen? Weekly came to him, the teenage hacker who had anything about it. Uh oh no! Kelly stimulated Gerald erotically as loudly as if a rod and his and as he owes me tender steak. Perfect. The hot shot software developer Bruce stood on her consciousness a little longer. Get me Margaret, you sure we do know that, Mr. Man, said nothing. Then they reached her neck and flipped through the door. She preened. He turned away with me. Quickly! Inside! She really wanted either. She surely loved those hankies aren't your parents had her face been struggling to be a month that somebody famous... Abraham Lincoln? <laughs> she went over to Memphis and gave a black and he wouldn't take you away and want to scream. Wanted. She rushed to him and gave one more thing. It would not open and shut, admitting one in Hunt Within. Isaacs couldn't imagine. Her voice behind him and then looked again, typed another letter. Then you can love me off balance into her own incredibly gorgeous copper-haired penny. Had at his takeoff checklist, got to the pictures. He had the crude fans, which were the club staff member polishing glasses. Flies like a peach juice de decade. It's important we talk. Isaacs knew what I was on. Oh, no! She simpered prettily at him in a code orange alert that was it. That's right. He wasn't worried about what had sufficient time to get married. Trembling with sympathy as she stepped forward. Say, I know my little Maggie. Oh, Andrew, you know somebody at the pictures, he told himself. She leaned in her dreams, or she leaned in case her dreams so badly. Maybe some fresh squeezed peach packed into the pool. He stood, watered. The ladies of the board can get up and down at him. If those spacers ain't your acquaintance, oh, ma'am, said the pilot, tipping his belt. His fancy, rendered by now, has come, he said morosely. Can you, but I just thought to keep the two in the gutter maybe banging? Or maybe it was that way. She didn't know that. Isaacs took his privates like this. Penny would be <laughs> married. In the air, heat waves shimmered off by it. She had been fun. But it was that guy's name? She couldn't really be forgiven for ladies, the geezer who got into Bruce's jacket and took away the door opening behind him. Bubbles responded irritatingly. Bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the fuck was Bubbles again? Bub Pretend that that's Bruce. He'll be married in a few words in his pants again and fished out the truth. Bruce swayed the other guy wasn't going to be able to glad to be uh, wasn't going to be glad to reign. Thought as he was rumored hesitating. Callie analyzed. They fooled me. Well, he had his life. The man slipped off his takeoff checklist, got out of them. Wasn't even Bruce's hot. And once she, cried. you should know somebody at all about getting her mind vomit forth the floor where his cubicle was. On a sip from a feud code of photocopy of consequences, she kept there. She had, she still had heard right. Penny said he had come it. To, yeah, Penny said he had had said he had it come to its tight skirt. Did Callie like a peach juice? It's important. They needed a hot tip and didn't know. You should have figured it out like this. Penny's his was gorgeous sunshine on the rail of the clients. Uh, who's fucking talking? <laughs> <laughs> She rushed to the bottom. She was out to punch sound change and down his pants again in the Ken's class suits. Callie had inherited a terrorist attack in her office, I think of that. <laughs> but she got to the car and creep. <laughs> but the black belly is here. Well, the belly? Bruce reached into her closet to us vans. The top half of them would not let it touch, would not let him touch. Although her eyes opened, crinkling her short hair trigger. What could she, what could be she purred, and soon they make such a minute minute observation. Behind him, the club staff praised. Of course. Who knew? 
Oh, Callie slunk over with a man with sympathy as he held his pants again to avoid saying anything white to speak about the behavior of her tight polka dot dress, the Homeland Security system, and pull them through the side. LP exclaimed, <laughs> let me look black with him, especially the creak of his mind. He had his mind. He fitted into Bruce's jacket and tie. His hand up hit. He discovered his name was too small for Friday. Said it's not open for such a call from a commie round, he told himself. She surely loved those huge mosquitoes. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh yeah oh, oh yes. yes oh she yes <laughs> she loves them she knows some quick revivals at this time and kept the cool in the guy at the pocket of her fingers across the desert and then when is he gonna be back bruce limped around and around saw pondered and said who he had thought believe it baby muttered venice tossing aside his paper and pushed the cleaners i could he wasn't murray uh wasn't worried about margaret he said Marie. Uh, can you write right there? She gave him "Hey Babs" stick pointed over or pointed out over the Air Force, especially when Bruce came to a hot tip on the wall, unlocked one with Andrew Venice was going to the door, undulating provocatively as he ran afoul of a man who wasn't going all the way down to the seat so badly. Maybe some kippers, and they went to keep a tent around the both. Afterward, Andrews, you think we can get up in the black? Who oh, no! Callie tossed her gunmetal steel gray desk, pecking out a letter, looked again, typed another. Bruce Lucent, no why. So she thought she'd order something frozen, but nobody does anything white to make herself wake up, she thought knowingly. All things in life and Isaac's brick red complexions until morning. Maybe she'd get married? Trembling with your right mind would go out to the floor, and Isaac's hesitated. He wanted to do with Andrew Venice was always important. They fell to have been he who wasn't all. She was hungry and the son of the money man. I just lost the time. <laughs> Same. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So did I. <laughs> One of the the top. Yeah. With the big toe around it. That was it. Stephen Weekly sounded his reply. I'm fine. Don't worry about what it was. She struggled to a rolling boil, only faintly flawed by listening. You such a hot little nurse worth her medium short brown hair. Do you need you to have be married trembling with delight? She heard the other guy give massages and off my back. And oh, if she had taken him and planted a sloppy lipstick drenched kisses upon his chest, I was back there. She couldn't help him over the edge of the very best of the ladies. He laughed weakly. His Blackberry was a girl to appreciate the usual number of white carefully capped teeth. Just remember, I've got to her peerless eyes. No, darling. It stopped very suddenly. Was that awake? Or what was awake? She does seem to be more sound. Stephen! The rain was coming down at him. I could only break us. I could. He paused for two weeks. How it felt to actually harm the Saris sometimes once he had dated the fridge. He had his relationship simple, discreet, between the day. Well, he was pacing and pacing and driving. Bubbles looked up. Who's, who's Bubbles? Did I miss a Bubbles? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's why Bubbles that was a, new... a character in one paragraph. Oh, okay. yeah, it's the secretary. Okay. <laughs> it's the secretary to a private detective who told Bruce Lucen that he was adopted and finally was black. <laughs> ah. Okay, makes sense. Makes mm -hmm. sense. The <laughs> yeah. smile, the smile broadened and quite dead husband Henry Archer, biggest nuisance when you get any clothes on. So how about one more note at his ears? Although he was rumored to watch the pool to get married by Elvis. Elvis. Venice looking out farther than the end of them, and to be married, in case her pretty face toward a tall, swarthy man had made her smile. How hard could Morgan have some kippers and grimace when he discovered much to her across the deeply carpeted floor? Heedless of consequences, she husked, she husked her voice seductively. Why, well, yes. Yeah. Bruce ripped through the frosted glass window of the tangles. No doubt about getting her, I couldn't help it. It made for it was, as well put a Desert Eagle 44 Magnum to her eyes, crinkling her red hair trigger. What were you in her pants that was still pining over and went to the businessman? This is literally the Garfield fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> there was a Desert Eagle even in the Garfield fanfic. <laughs> but yeah essentially, that, yeah, essentially that paragraph was uh, randomly generated with uh, parses of uh, text that were previously in the novel. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Makes that sense. was essentially the f last 33 chapters all summed up into one. <laughs> all right, so now cool. chapter 35, back to normality somehow. Uh -huh. The big cliff, bottom peach, that was the peach tree sports club sign revolving the humid hair. 
heat wave shimmered off the concrete like the sound of car horns made visibly. <laughs> Everything was coated with a fine grey dust from the construction site across town, and the air smelled like cement. The heavy door slid open and shut, admitting one man to the cool and dark of the very best of private club. The hair was only faintly flawed by the smell of a pool and brass polish being rubbed on the rail of the bar that will not open for another two hours officially. Morning, Mr. Isaacs, said the staff member polishing glasses. Like some juice? No, Ruben, said the businessman. I want the wife and the kids. Fine, sir. Going to work out? I'll be here when you get back. It was a hot morning, and the sun reflected off the western windows of the building opposite highlighted Isaac's brick-red complexions until he looked like a very son of the financial world. The Wall Street yep. Journal furled in his huge hand. He came the down the stair into the pool area. Black came eyes, the down the stair. And... <laughs> Black eyes shooting from side and to side, and he looked around him. It made for a great spot to watch the women, but it was a damn nuisance when you were on your way to the exercise room. The air was always heavy with humidity, and the series sometimes had wet footprints from where people slipped away for some quick revivers at the bar. He paused for a moment in front of the floor to ceiling mirrors to admire his trim waist and braid shoulders. At 66, man could not afford to neglect himself if he wanted to stay on top of his form and, a tap, and on the tap of the ladies. He wasn't the only man who liked sleek, curved, sport model redheads. A man expected to pay to enjoy the quality goods and his ruddy red penny, Penelope Urbain, was quality. He frowned at the sight of Steve. Steve something. The beach boy blonde guy gave massages, and Isaacs would not let him touch him. He was too curious about other people's business. Someone had told him that Penny had once dated the gut, or maybe some bodies who sort of looked like him. Isaac couldn't imagine why. So wait a minute, is is Penny and Penelope the same person? Is that just a nickname, or are they two? I I don't know. I guess so. You don't know? Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's right. Steve survived. Remember when he was bleeding out in that one apartment because he was looking at someone's fridge? Yep, he's uh, fine yeah. now. <laughs> He got better. I do not remember this. Oh, uh, yeah, that's chapter 33 if you ever want to go oh, back to it. I, I don't, so it's just... <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the recap. He got shot trying to eat a cake. Yep. <laughs> and now he's alive and well. Yeah. Uh, okay. Perhaps she was young and curious. An older, experienced man could save her a lot of gores. And here the wimp was coming right over as if he and Isaac spoke every day. Good morning, ensues the messers. Will we have a cup of latte? Maybe some fresh squeezed peach juice? It's important we talk. Isaac grunted and kept walking. Everyone wanted to talk to him, and it was always important. They needed a hot tip on the market, or they had a hot tip and didn't know how to cash in. It's really important, said the voice behind him, and Isaacs hesitated. He couldn't believe our ears. Face red as a traffic stop, the financier swung on his heel. Yes, he snarled. It's about Penny, said the back rubber. Isaac <laughs> saw red. No one knew about Penelope. He liked to keep his relationship simple, discreet, between the sheets and nothing more. What? He bellowed as if he could not believe his ears, although he knew he had heard right. <laughs> Penny, said the bleached blonde without backing away as he should have. He knows <laughs> something, thought Isaacs, wishing, not for the first time, that he had the connections to make people disappear. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? Not that well, he wants to kill a man. Not that What's he will have fucking dead. Yeah, not that he will have used them, but having something to hint at will be a helpful thing. It will ruin his coy relationship with the cops, and that was more useful. What? He said again to avoid saying anything else. I know. The pause was significant. Seeing Penelope Urbe. Nonsense, barked the money man. I have pictures, pure the messers. You were at her apartment just last night. 
Isaacs reached out a ruddy hand and tore a manila envelope from the other's grasp, ripped it open and flipped through the pictures inside. Could be anybody, he said. It's not I. But it was, he admitted to himself. There were not many men who had such broad shoulders and so narrow a weight. Even in the dim and blurry shots, there was every reason to know whose arm Penny was clinging to. And Penny, his gorgeous copper-haired Penny, had had her face toward a streetlight and had photographed beautifully. <laughs> Isaac yep, shot a black? Is yeah. What? This is happening. Alright! Good night, everybody! I hope you enjoyed! Okay. <laughs> Alright. And Heli, look at the young man. No point tearing them up, the wimp said. I have them on a disc. They could go out over the internet and reach everyone over whoever heard of you and a lot you didn't. They call it spam. He had it, and it doesn't come in a can. But you're too old to know that. <laughs> that's a great line. I don't know why that's in this. Like that's a great. <laughs> I wish I'd have written that line. I, I oh, kind of want this to be like a Duke Nukem one line or now. You just kill a guy. to call it spam, and it doesn't come in a can. You're too dead to know that. <laughs> Isaacs Good owns burn. several minor telecom corporations and a solid share of two of the majors, but he ignored the slur. Like you shooting the black, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, fuck you, goddamn. Penny will be upset if her picture went out like this. Penny was a girl to appreciate the good things in life, and Isaacs knew what they were and had what it took to pay for them. He wasn't worried about Bruce Lucent. Lucent was a has-been before he ever became anything once he plowed his fancy rented Vitamond car into a telephone pool. <laughs> they said the cast went right up to his groin. That guy wasn't going to be making any ladies happy. <laughs> <Nope>. <laughs> no, it was Penny Isaacs thought of. A, t a picture of his hand up her skirt and on her bare bottom all over the world will sour things with Penny for good. The pool's aquamarine tile dip beckoned to him. Isaac locked both hands on the masseur's forearm and pulled him in the pictures backward into the chlorine scented depth. That take care of the picture. That takes care of the pictures. He thought as he shoved at the youth's face, struggling to hold him under with a greater strength and body weight. He was counting seconds. It will not do to actually harm the blackmailer. Scare him will be useful. Ten seconds. He thought and released his grip and swam from the side. Help! Yeah. Oh. Help! He yelled. He coughed and he coughed and gasped as it he had been he who had swallowed water. Call it the cops! It was the surprise that had taken enough balance. A few words in the right ears and this wet nose EST will be glad to leave town. Atlanta was too small for the pair of them, and Isaacs knew which one was going to have to go. He fitted into the puzzle of local politics, law, charities, and religions perfectly. What's his name was a nobody, and he will stay that way. Already the club staffs were running to help him over the edge of the pool. He, he stood, water running everywhere, and said, That the man grabbed my home and sent me off balloons into the pool. He'd won already. Isaacs knew. They were fishing the other guy out of the other side of the pool to keep the two of them apart. The manager, incongruous in high heels on the pool level, was already at his side. Red lacquered lips gleaming in the overhead lighting, pouring out apologies. A raccoon hide rolled with sympathy as she purred and fussed. Just get out your robe and send that suit to the cleaner! I have a spare suit in my cubicle, he said. If I could join you in your office, I think we need to talk about the behavior of your staff. Of course, said the manager. You poor dear, I can't imagine. 
Her voice faded as Isaacs made his exit, gratified that someone was going to have to go van the floor and carpet all the way up to the fourth floor where his cubicle was, on the exclusive Platinum Peach Executive Cabin and level. He had already seen the soggy shreds of his paper and the, p and the pictures fluttering like rotting leaves in the bottom of the pool and the pool cleaner maneuvering his equipment into a place to clear the water. The ladies of the club were due to have their private hour in a few minutes, and some of them will even enter the water before they showered, did their hair and makeup, and had a liquid and gossipy lunch in the Georgia Gill Grill. Isaacs had never set a foot in the place. The avenged age of the off girl was 45, and the real babes were at work or working out at this time of the day. Isaacs took his time lathering the hair all over his body, Rinsing twice, once hot and once cold. Will do the manager good to sit in her office and worry about what had happened. Whatever the kid's name was, his job was history. And a few words to the police. Better do it now, thought Isaacs. And, cry and grimace when he discovered his cell phone had gone into the pool with him. That was one thing he hadn't thought to keep a spare of here. His Blackberry was ruined too, but he kept that back up. Shit, he said elegantly. <laughs> he smiled at himself in the mirror, revealing a lot of white, carefully kept teeth. Just one more thing he could complain to the manager about. One more touch of reality. Although her, desk... Out, Torko, can't swim. <laughs> Although her desk was intended to look imposing, Lucille McKenzie looked cornered behind it when Isaacs walked in. She stood. I am so sorry, she said. He grabbed your arm, you said? You didn't really want the police. What did my attention about the summer thing, said Isaacs. I can't stop to talk with everyone, and he wouldn't take a hint. My suit's ruined, my cellophane, my blackberry. <laughs> well, the cop will pay for everything, said Lucille. I don't know what to say about Stevie. Is that his name? Rasp Isaacs? Yes. Steve Suffern is popular with many of the clients. She toyed with a letter opener. You say he touched you. I'm sure he meant well. I'm not, I'm not a man to make a fuss, said Isaacs, knowing that meant they both knew that as a member of the board he was a man who could and did. But if I hit my head when he sent me for a tumble. Oh, God! Well, Miss McKenzie. <laughs> I mean, we have to think of the club. A lawsuit could break us. I just lost a few things in some time. Do we have a contract? Uh, oh, whoops. That was Isaacs. Oh, well. She, she turned into a parrot very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We all have our employees in contracts, Mr. Isaacs. <laughs> we know that. She went to the file cabinets along the wall, unlocked one, and haunted within. Isaacs and mm. mirrored her rear in its tight skirt. <laughs> like a peach back in those stretch licro. She had been good looking in her time and kept herself up, but here it is! <laughs> Garbled <laughs> Lucille. Let me look that whore! growled Isaacs. She handed it to him along with a fetching glimpse of the top half of her black lace bra and the low, low neckline of her blouse. Behind there, on the industrial gray wall, filled the wall with hints of a world beyond Atlanta. I think we can just ask me, he paused. Suffern! supplied Lucille. His name is Suffern! He's popular! I think the board can just ask him to leave. We can't risk a lawsuit. Something goes wrong about... Uh, oh, wait. Something goes wrong <laughs> about an incident like this. The board and management could be seen as negligent. Oh, yes, I see! said Lucille. See, it's won the agenda for Friday, said Isaacs. I have to go get to... I have to get about my business. He needed to speak to a contractor or two in the police to make sure anything suffer and had at its place was removed before the boy got sacked. Hmm. All right, chapter <laughs> 36. Who's the lucky reader? MC. I, yeah, I can do. I feel yeah. like I've missed a lot and yet nothing you at all. Didn't miss <laughs> you missed nothing. It's yeah. like changed that one lady's voice like three times, but that's that. <laughs> I, I, no, I appreciate that he couldn't keep Isaac straight during that entire chapter. Also, there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, time for chapter thirty-six, page two fifty-one. I said, "Yeah, Discord's being a little choppy for me." <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 it's doing that for me too. You might want to oh, switch no. voice servers. Oh, maybe that'd be a good idea. Let's do it. 
change the voice there. Yes. Yep, I totally changed my voice over. Uh, <laughs> Discord, you're broken now. Oh, oh no. Discord is broken like a microphone. Tequila. Are we still switching or am I just going to read now? You're going to read. I don't know. Okay, I'm yeah. going to go. Just read. read. For fuck's okay. sake, I don't care where he. It would pick One day to... he'll figure out how it works. It's fine. It would pick today to rain, thought Venice. Thought out, looking out the window into the early morning rain. Everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Who said that? Somebody famous? Abraham Lincoln? Or maybe Benjamin Franklin? <laughs> Andrew Venice impatiently pushed the question out of his mind. He was the kind of man who did things, not thought about them. And today was the day. Well, he had his plans. The rain was coming down steady, bucketfuls. Not the gentle kind of summer rain that maketh the little flowers grow, but a drenching, cold Georgia rain that nobody in his right mind would go out. Go out and if they had any sense or, for that matter, choice in the matter. The rain didn't look like it was going to stop anytime soon either. Andrew Venice shrugged his manly shoulders. He had his plans. And he wasn't going to let a little bad weather stop him from doing what a man had made up his mind to do. And Arthur Venice was every single inch a man. Wait, 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 hold on. <laughs> Wasn't it another name? Or am I just lost in the um... shittiness of this? I'm oh yeah, sure. Archer Venice. It's Andrew Venice. Oh, okay, <laughs> I thought it did sound familiar. No, it's uh, another one of those chapters where they keep changing the name. <laughs> <laughs> and Arthur Venice was every single inch a man. He had no doubt at all about that. Neither did anyone who had anything to do with him, especially the scum who ran afoul of him in the course of his police work. Some people might think that at the age of forty. He might be getting on in years, but nobody oh. who had anything to do with Andrew Venice was going to have any questions about his manliness. That's what I like about Margaret, he told himself. She knows it's a good thing when she sees it, and knows it's enough to grab onto it and not let go. With a body like that, a man could get used to being grabbed onto. <laughs> he chuckled to himself. <laughs> 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 he turned away from the window. Time was a wasting. Time was a, was a wasting. Was, time was a wasting. He was a man with a plan, and he knew just what he wanted. Time to go ahead and just do it. <laughs> <laughs> time to do the plan. <laughs> the plan, you know the plan. <laughs> the plan. <laughs> Margaret studied her pretty face in the circular magnifying mirror above her makeup table. She hadn't slept well last night, and to her practiced eye at least, it showed just her luck to be called on for an extra shift in the ER on a night when the heavy rain had caused us twice the usual number of accidents. She'd had to cancel plans for the evening. <laughs> <laughs> what? What is so far? Next one. All right. Yeah, when she'd had to cancel her rain. plans for the evening. <laughs> a night at the movies with Jocelyn. He'd planned on seeing the latest Eddie Murphy. <laughs> 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 uh, the story knows. The... <laughs> it knows what happened last Friday. Right. The newest Ja Rule movie with <laughs> <laughs> Murphy and Ja Rule in one film. Uh. At last. That Murphy always made her laugh uproariously. Which has the best remedy for a set of nerves frayed by the sight of too much blood and too many hopelessly fractured bodies. Oh, that Murphy. Instead, she'd had a full dose of exactly what she'd wanted to escape. The movie would have been fun. Oh, the movie would have... No, okay, did we? Okay. But deep down inside, she knew <laughs> that it wasn't what she really wanted either. She looked deep, deep into her, pu her own peerless eyes an enigmatic smile blossomed upon her ruby jaws. She'd almost turned Jocelyn down, hoping for a call from him. She had a hunch, all right. Ruby jaw? 
Yeah, Ruby yeah. Jaws. You know, her, her, her <laughs> lipstick that she's very bad at applying. Yeah, <laughs> ah, it's yes. just like, yeah. hey, you totally smile from the jaw, right? <laughs> smile with your entire jaw. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any nurse worth her salt knew. Uh, 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 like that. After all, she was a woman first and a nurse second. The smile broadened. It went to her eyes, crinkling her nose as it went past. Like no, a so you gotta jump your swipe jaw me. smile like that. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta do it right. <laughs> like a hard car side swipe by a passing delivery truck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 Let me read it again. The smile broadened and went to her eyes, crinkling her nose as it went past like a parked car side swiped by a passing delivery truck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maggie baby, there will be plenty of time for more movies and plenty of time for other, too. She told her smiling reflections silently. What plenty of time. Other? What is the other? <laughs> what is he referring to? Plenty of time. Plenty of time. The doorbell buzzed, startling her, seemingly as loudly as if a rousing basketball game had just come. <laughs> had a final conclusion. What a basketball game! Why are we playing basketball now? Uh, Margaret Eastman stood almost unconsciously glancing down at her voluptuous body clad only in flimsy peignoir peignoir could it be could it yes her woman's intuition told her yes yes she rushed to the door undulating provocatively <laughs> she strode <laughs> across. Like every bit of piece of text that contains <laughs> the word undulating more than this <laughs> God. She rushed to the door, undulating provocatively as she strode impetuously across, across the deeply carpeted floor. Heedless. <laughs> it's fucking shag is what it is. <laughs> Heedless of consequences, she flung the door open, and there he stood, a tempting vision of manhood, even in a dripping berber. A checked slouch hat protected his hair, as she might have noticed if he had had sufficient time for a minute observation, a minute observation. <laughs> Behind him, the pelting Georgia rain poured down, cruel and relentless as the, as the sands of time. <laughs> Come in at once, she cried. You must not be seen here. <laughs> Out on the sidewalk behind him, the pedestrians of Atlanta strolled by idly, little noting, nor likely long to remember, the tempestuous passions coming to a rolling boil only a few feet away from their languid gazes. Mm. I care not a rap who sees us, growled Andrew Venice, for, for it was, as any astute reader must by now have guessed, none other than he who had impetuously <laughs> rung her bell. <laughs> I'm, I'm here to carry you away with me. Quickly, inside, she repeated, gasping his lapels and impelling him through the door. She pushed it shut behind her and turned to fix him with her sultry gaze, leaning voluptuously back leaning against the voluptuously. panel door. <laughs> yeah, leaning <laughs> back against the panel door she had just that moment closed. I cannot believe that you are here at last, she hissed. I have thought, believe it, baby muttered Venice, tossing his hat. The raincoats followed, then his jacket and tie, his belt, his undershirt. <laughs> it fell to the deeply carpeted floor, pawing. Get up, pawing a... <laughs> no, pawing they're gonna another... have to deal with cleaning that fucking shag carpet. <laughs> pawing one another like impassioned mammals. Oh, she moaned. Andrew, I never thought. Don't think, baby, he said with a nuance at once manly and indescribably tender. His hand uh, moved surely. For a while, he said nothing. Then soft murmurs broke from Margaret's lips. They built, inevitably, under his expertly administered caresses <laughs> to a crescendo of moans, and then the sky exploded around them both. <laughs> oh, there's leaks in this? <laughs> no, it's a thunderstorm. You don't understand. <laughs> 
Afterwards, Andrew Venice lit a matched pair of cigarettes and gave one of and gave one to his exhausted but still visibly an eager lover. I have come, he said softly. I'm sure. <laughs> to I, take I, you no, I just like like the idea of a matched pair of cigarettes as if he could have taken them from two different fucking boxes. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're they're engraved. <laughs> ah, I see monogram cigarettes. Uh, Margaret. Yeah, it's totally time for a new patently obvious invention. The fuck cigarettes. They come in pack yeah. of two. One for you, one for the other. But what <laughs> if I have a threesome? <laughs> well, then you can have the special three pack. <laughs> Margaret, you hot little nurse. I can hardly wait to make you all my own. Where do you want to get married? Trembling with delight, she thought. She thought a moment, then sighed. Memphis, of course. I want to be married by Elvis. That is the saddest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis, Venice, Pound. <laughs> won't that won't that be easier in Vegas? Yeah. I, I know a couple of chapels there. They've got the pink Cadillac and everything. She shook her head. Her short hair falling for a moment in front of her peerless eyes. No, darling. It must be as close as possible to Graceland. It wouldn't be real anywhere else. Let's just raise then... Elvis from the dead <laughs> to take care of my wedding. Do they have a lot of Elvis impersonators in Memphis? Hmm. Probably. I don't Maybe. know. Like... Who knows? You may then... now kiss the bride. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Sykes my Sykes my favorite Canadian Elvis person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then she gave him a coy smile. Then you can love me tender. <laughs> oh, into these blue suede shoes you take me. <laughs> uh, perfect, he exclaimed. Let me make a phone call. I ought to be able to get us there in time to get married before supper. And there's a great rib joint on Beale Street. If you feel like eating that, it is What a cute. fucking good ass <laughs> wedding. What a romantic <laughs> wedding. <laughs> Get married by Elvis and go eat at a rib joint. <laughs> I had her lobster oh shoes. God. Do you want a great rib or do you want a great rib? <laughs> Just ask Elvis if he can recommend a place nearby. <laughs> <laughs> He leered and patted her buttock. Do you know somebody at the airline? She was already on her feet, thinking about what to pack. Did she have anything white to wear? Then she realized it didn't matter. She was going to be married in Memphis. It was a dream come true. So like, why better, did my baby? butt Black break? Black Just jacket broke night by not Atlanta. It <laughs> <laughs> <Night> broke. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time. Even better, baby. He blew a smoke ring, then continued. Here's where, here's where Bin, here's where Bin a cop comes in hand. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got me I a punk dope Bin. Bin, maybe. Oh, whatever. I got me a punk dope smuggler by the short hairs. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a private jet. He owes me big time, and now is my chance to call a big favor. No waiting in the law of security lines for my little Maggie. Oh, Andrew, you think of everything, said Margaret. She turned around and looked at him, lying naked on her deep carpet. It's Shag. <laughs> her, enigma her enigmatic smile returned as she stepped forward. Say, I just thought of something myself. She knelt beside him and gave a shake of her medium short brown hair. Do you need to... To make a phone call now, or can we, or can it wait a little longer? Get me started, and it'll be a bit longer, baby. He grimaced, but she lowered her voluptuous body to the carpet next to him, and soon they were both moaning again. <laughs> it was it was a long time before he remembered to call his smuggler friend. Too wow. busy fucking to remember to call his drug buddy. <laughs> He was he fucking in the shag carpet. Have fun. <laughs> the pilot turned out to be a, a slimly built black man wearing a neatly trimmed mustache and goatee and a peaked cap. 
Oh my god, it's Eddie Murphy! It's Eddie Murphy. Ah, I beat you. He reminded me. Not Eddie Murphy, just look in the next slide. He reminded Margaret of an African American version of Nikolai Lennon. What? (laughs) 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 When she stepped out of Venice's car onto the tarmac next to the smuggler's Lear jet, the pilot looked looked her up, looked her up and down in obvious appreciation. I gotta say, you sure know how to pick him, Mr. Man. He said with a throaty whistle. What? <laughs> How's that sound? Throaty <laughs> whistle. Just whistle with your throat. <laughs> <laughs> Just gotta put all your throat into it. Work up a few organs. <laughs> the opposite of a duck call. <laughs> uh, did you ever doubt it? Said Venice putting a protective arm around Margaret's shoulder. Maggie, this punk is Scooter Bill Delacroix, and there ain't a slicker pilot outside the Air Force, especially when he's carrying contraband, which I've got reason to believe is most of the time. (laughs) But aren't you a fucking (laughs) cop? (laughs) Yeah, but he's dirtier than that shag carpet. (laughs) (laughs) Pleased to make your acquaintance, man, said the pilot, tipping his cap ceremoniously. Now, why don't you two lovebirds get on board so as we can get up in the air and I can get this big old cop to Memphis and off of my back <laughs> and bring home a plain load of coke and I don't mean to, <laughs> and I don't mean to drink the <laughs> <laughs> Bring home a plain load of coke and I don't mean to drink and I don't mean to drink and <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they are in Atlanta. It's an easy mistake. <laughs> well, well, strip you can snort. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, well, I reckon I'll be too busy to stop you this time. Just remember, I've got the goods on you, Cooter. Treat me right, and or you'll regret it. <laughs> I, surely, I surely do know that, Mister Man," <laughs> said Cooter Bill. What? <laughs> the clown. Cl- <laughs> the cl- <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> they climbed aboard his plane with him trailing behind them. It seemed only a matter of moments as he ran through his takeoff checklist, got clearance from the tower, and soon they were winging west through the gorgeous sunshine on their way to Memphis and marriage. So, are these characters dead to us now that they're no longer in Atlanta? I don't know. <laughs> Personally, I'm pretty sure that well, what happened probably did not happen <laughs> anyway. <so. laughs> All right, so, <laughs> are you gonna take chapter thirty-seven? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. oh <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Oh yeah, that's right. Okay. He flew from Atlanta to Mur- to Memphis. I mean, I don't know my. Geography, let's see how far away that is. That's not that far. Not really. I could have Tennessee, driven there. Tennessee's one state up from Georgia. <laughs> like Atlanta, maps, di- directions to Memphis. <laughs> Five hour drive through six hour drive. Oh, it ain't too bad. I mean, that's kind of far away, maybe. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, five-hour well, drive. I mean, they did want to go to the steakhouse and get some ribs, too. So. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's a rib house. Yeah, it's a rib joint. Why would you go to a steakhouse to get ribs, MC? That's ridiculous. Uh, I don't know. It's fucking ridiculous, one, MC. Yeah. <laughs> MC needs to learn how food it. works. Damn it. <laughs> You try going into Memphis with that kind of talk, see how you fit. <laughs> hey, can I get a steak here? Boy, this is a rib drawer. Get out of here. Oh, no. What have I done? I'm sorry, but I've got nothing but ribs here. Over my dead <laughs> blue so it shows. Oh. Um, so, like, you know what I sound like? No, it's like you sound like a TV evangelist having a stroke. <laughs> I thought I thought he was doing like Jimmy Stewart doing office <laughs> or something. That, that. <laughs> that was another one. <laughs> Remember what the government says. You better praise God or else you're going to die. Huh? <laughs> Shit, you're right. 
Anyway, chapter 37. <laughs> let's move on. The only way to survive is cash, huh? <laughs> so, chapter 37. Okay. Let's go. Chapter 37. It was one of those days that just made every pore in your body sweat. So everything was so slick so that you left cheek marks when you stood up from vinyl seats. The kind you tried to wipe away quickly with your hands so no one would. But they had to know because you had those stripes on your thighs. Now. <laughs> what? This paragraph is good. <laughs> it was the hot like only Atlanta could get. Kelly Archer would never forget the kind of hot that day was. It was the day she knew that all she had was to that all she had was to Henry Archer was a trinket, a bauble, another art piece like that weird statuary that for, that lined the foyer of the mansion. She might be no more than another car for the showroom he built out in the barn. The showroom, the barn. <laughs> another train for the train tracks he ran around the tree at Christmas and across the living room and down the hall and through the party room and up the stairs even to their bedroom. Trains and cars, and he had a model, and he had a lot of model airplanes too, like the plane he used to chase those dogs at the park. The fat cocker what? kneeling, the fat cocker keeling over with a heart attack <laughs> when the World War II comic plane chasing around. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I like this. So this Henry is Archer is just job. using toy airplanes to kill dogs? He's a collector of airplanes and dead dogs. <laughs> and trains. Don't <laughs> forget trains. It had been so hot. Callie came home furious that the air in the Mercedes couldn't keep up, and she'd been stuck in traffic on the Beltline and found no one had thought to turn the air on in the mansion. She felt desperate to cool off. She'd rushed for the patio, thinking to throw herself into the pool, Versace dress and all, when she saw them. Actually, just him. She didn't realize she was he wasn't alone at first. If she had seen he wasn't alone, she might not have made the first assumption she did. <laughs> Henry. Who's Henry? <laughs> Henry Archer, the dead millionaire. It doesn't matter. He has oh, okay, it's a flashback. Anything. Okay. No, it's... Maybe he's, <laughs> he's just back again. alive because why? He's just back alive again, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> Henry was naked, struggling to maneuver over a lawn chair. His butt cheeks clenched and dimpled as he moved, like he was trying to pull himself free. For half an instant, she thought maybe he'd rolled over while sunbathing and caught his member in the lawn. She realized his ink was beginning to show in the coarse hairs and wrinkles. She was on the verge of bursting out and laughing. Everything okay, Henry? Or Henry? She trilled in that false voice she used when she was trying to hide her true feelings. He stopped moving and seemed to at last pull himself free and turned, revealing that muscular chest and thick neck of a bodybuilder far younger than 60. Except he was 60 and kept working out. That's what had attracted <laughs> her to him. A millionaire to marry was a dime a dozen, but millionaires who were built like that. <laughs> That's when she saw her husband wasn't alone. She let out a small horrified gasp and tossed back, and tossed her shining black dresses over one bared shoulder. What the fuck? Get out of here! <laughs> Callie shrieked. Oh, the woman beneath. Okay. The woman beneath him smiled at her saucily and slowly rolled from beneath Henry, her green eyes flashing out her defiance as she threw fire red tresses over her shoulders to reveal breasts so perfect they could only have been done by a pro. <laughs> Henry, did you buy all those? <laughs> oh, Callie, it's not what you think. Henry exclaimed as he stood still slick with the heat of his passion dripping water like he just hopped out of the pool, but Callie knew it was sweat because it was so hot and his hair wasn't wet. <laughs> you take me for it, it? She asked. <laughs> the woman nodded and giggled. The woman nodded and giggled as she sauntered toward the floral Indian pink and green dress she'd thrown over the bar. Colors that with that red hair were bound to look hideous. What could Henry have seen in her? She had freckles and looked like she hadn't even tried to cover them, and her hips were a little too wide. She looked like a good broad mare, but not like a thoroughbred. Callie was a thoroughbred. Sleek and finely muscled, soft where she needed to be, powerful where she needed to be. Now Callie noticed the empty wine bottle upended in the coal car of a train. The empty glass is set in one of the empty grain cars, so that if you flicked the switch, it could run out to the kitchen. Their clothes were scattered, tossed all over the patio and the deck furniture and bar. The woman flashed a hot pink bra out of the swimming pool with the skimmer, maneuvering the pole like a pro and acting as if she hadn't noticed Henry and Callie. Uh... I'll call you, the woman said as she came <laughs> across the patio carrying. I can't do that many female voices across the patio carrying her dripping bra over her shoulder and grabbing her dress. He read stilettos clicked on the marble as she paced down the hall of the mansion lined with train tracks. I'm sorry, Callie, I didn't expect you, Henry grimaced. 
His eyes touched her hair, following the curve of her glossy black mane to that bared shoulder. If she took one more deep breath, it would fall, certainly, and reveal a breast that had yet begun to show its age. What does that even fucking mean? <laughs> ah, boom! She got a wrinkled ass tit. That's what. <laughs> That's great of me. Callie pointedly didn't look at him. Instead, she was looking at his groin, the offending part now less bold. How long has this been going on? She stated. Really, my dear, just this once. You're all I need. I rejoice every day that a woman so young, I can't believe you're only 40, so voluptuous, so incredibly wonderful, could want me. I beg that you will forgive me. Stay beside me as I end my golden years. <laughs> Callie felt the cold, hard place. <laughs> yeah. Callie felt the cold, hard place inside her begin to warm a little and tried to force it back inside her to cling to the anger she should feel for the way he wronged her, right here in her own house. Well, actually, his house, but like hers because they lived here together. <laughs> Callie told him angrily. I didn't even notice. You have to understand we were drunk. I was at the <laughs> polo club excuse. and I had two many drinks. Uh, I saw Richard there and we got talking. One thing led to another and they kept handing me drinks. I don't know if she'd been there with Richard or knew her, but suddenly there she was. I should have known better. And she was there. I don't even remember her name. I couldn't even call her because we had sex. I didn't know it. And you weren't. <laughs> and that horror fiber beast you know so well rolled up from within to consume me. It was wrong. It was so wrong, Callie. I beg you for my <laughs> He offered. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> Could it have been the drinks? He did appear flushed in the face, and there was the empty wine bottle. And how many drinks had they had at the polo club? You like me, Henry Archer! She stated, regally. regally. <laughs> yeah, picture it here, regally. <laughs> <laughs> it's a limit! Don't ever know it again! <laughs> Henry could see from her eyes that she was softening her stance that he was pull her back and corral her as he had every time she'd started to pull it from the paddock. She wasn't a filly anymore, not like when he first spied her, but she wasn't an old nag yet either. He liked it when she decorated his arm, when her laugh rose up into the chandeliers during parties, when she screamed out her ecstasy when he rode her in the wee hours. She was still a fine mare, and he wasn't ready to put her out to pasture. <laughs> fun For one, she would cost him too much. <laughs> Kelly watched his face change from the humble fear of someone caught in a very great lie to the defiance of one thinking how they might defend themselves to that tender look his face always turned when they had just made love. She forgave him. How could she not? Losing him would be worse than anything she could imagine. If he died, that might be worse. Or not. At least dying would be something accidental. Or at least not his fault. Not like mm -hmm. him leaving her for a younger woman, a younger with a horrid taste in clothes, freckles, and red hair. <laughs> it's not like she it's not like she thought she couldn't bear to live without him. She probably wouldn't much notice, but she didn't want to have to go through all of this again to ensure he's to ensure he's security. But she never forgot the important lesson she had learned, like that she was like any other favorite toy that would put away by a child, and that child sees a newer, brighter, fancier toy right there where they can reach it. And if the child's judgment was impaired by too much wine, <laughs> they forget all about the <laughs> Just, that kid is trash. <laughs> that was the lesson of the Atlanta heat, and she could never sweat again without thinking of that. <laughs> Can't stop thinking about drunk kids. <laughs> Every the time lesson I of the Atlanta my heat. dead husband, I think about drunk children playing with toys. <laughs> yep. Atlanta. She could, she could <laughs> never sweat again. Oh my god. She could never sweat again and leave a mark on her seat. Yeah. And try to Except you know him. because of the stripes on her thighs. Exactly. <laughs> stripes <laughs> everyone sees a billion of miles away. All right. Chapter 38. I suppose you're wondering why I've called you here, stated Harcher and Nance seriously. Peering over the glasses he didn't really need and only wore because they made him look more intellectual and impressive. Down to the quivering cerulean depth of the glistening orb of the deliciously beautiful young lady sitting in the dusty brown chair in front of his desk, which was also brown. Irene <gasps> <Yep. laughs> was wearing a black suit today that hugged the curve of her body, which were in all the right places, and in complete defiance of the scorching, humid Georgia summer hair time that turned almost everyone's hair into a mass of unappealing frizzles, or else a handful of limp stuff that resembled nothing more than masses of overcooked spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> she wore her long, luxurious hair, the color perfectly sun ripping wheat loose, and falling in shimmering golden cascade around her dinkly shoulder. Her slender so she's yet blonde. Okay. 
Yeah. Her slender yet perfectly nor form leg were hidden by Nancy's desk. But he knew they were there. Nancy. I would hope. So. I can <laughs> sense her legs. <laughs> they must be there. I mean, they generally, must. a human being needs legs, right? Look, Schrodinger's legs. We can't prove if they're there or not unless we observe them. Nance knew perfectly well that Irene was the last person in this whole tangled mess he would be having such crazy perverted thoughts about. I mean, even if she wasn't half my age, there was the involvement with Henry, and now he's dead, and she's supposed to be in mourning. Besides, there was the whole nature of the suspicions he'd been having about certain things, which of course was the whole reason he'd call Irene in to talk to today, which had nothing to do with the hidden passion that lay hidden under that prim black skirt, but that was m a matter of much seriousness and import. Yes, I am, Irene murmured liquidly, gazing up at the doctor. Goodness, but he was in good shape for a man his age. Just look at the Kawaii we <laughs> sure did it! <laughs> Fuck off! Kawaii, yeah! Kawaii. Oh my god! She could just imagine. Oh, that's Alright, she could Should've just imagine. Everybody, Everybody was Kung that. Fu fighting! Everybody was Kung Fu fucking! Oh no. No. <laughs> it's a different. She could just imagine the six pack he had under there. Apparently, being a doctor kept you in good shape, or maybe just played a lot of golf. Yeah, we we know that <laughs> golf really keeps you in shape. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, that's all. I'm not. I'm not seeing this part. That was golf. <laughs> Yeah, that's golf. Oh. Okay. A psychic impression of golf. Yeah. Oh. That's all Great. that it is. It's all Sid about Meyer swinging a ball, swinging at a ball and driving a, a cab. Okay. Well, I've been thinking a lot about what's been happening lately, ever since the accident. Nuns proclaim, rising from his seat and pacing restlessly around the desk, twiddling a pen absently. It's always seemed funny to me that Bruce Lucent survived a crash, and Henry Archer didn't. Watch Irene carefully like a hawk to see if she'd blush or have any reaction to this mention of Archer's death. But she looked as calm and smooth as an unused jar of peanut butter before someone <laughs> stuck the knife in. The cream kind, not the crunchy, because her skin's yeah. not lumpy like the lumps you get in crunchy peanut butter. <laughs> but chunky peanut butter is so much better. Most of the, most of the time people don't like uh, clarify that. I'm glad they clarified that. Yeah, I appreciate it. I don't think it's that strange. Commented Irene with a shrug, tossing a gleaming lock of hair over her shoulder with one perfectly man-cured hand. It's just the way things are, you know? Sometimes people live and sometimes they don't, especially in car crashes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's strange. Retorted Nance. Retorted. Yeah, retorted. I know you think it's strange, Irene snapped. You just said it. Don't you want to know why I think it's strange? Pain! Irene sighed. I guess I should let you tell me. She was starting to get bored. Hench and Archer and Nance were starting to look a lot less hot, even if he didn't have that sexy little mustache. <laughs> okay. So, are you trying to make Irene's voice Bob Dylan with chronic... <laughs> Maybe, who knows? You <laughs> should tell me... Okay, Archer began. Setting down the pencil before he stabbed himself with its point. He did this one, and it meant he couldn't work for days! <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, I, I gotta see how exactly you maneuver your pen or pencils whenever you play around with it. No, it's like, like when you go to, uh, you know... Click your pen for shits and giggles, and then you try clicking the wrong side and stab your thumb. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it's deeply relatable as someone who's fucking done it multiple <laughs> times. Alright. 
It hurts like crazy. I went to the doctors and they had to take the point out and everything. I think you can die yeah, see, of lead poisoning. Yeah, that's when you start asking questions. <laughs> I think you can die of lead poisoning if they don't get the point out. He clasped his muscular hands behind his back and commenced to pace around the small windowless office. There was a vase of flowers on his desk and the petals were slowly falling off them. It's about your father. My father, queried Hyrene, <laughs> looking surprised. Um, Obviously, this wasn't something she'd, ex she'd expected this handsome doctor to bring up. Archer stared at her. Did she look guilty or just surprised? Despite his usually extreme perspicaciousness in matter of judging the human Psygon <laughs> Psyogno <laughs> in time of <laughs> And also perspicaciousness. Come on, get with the program. <laughs> yeah, perspicaciousness. Which ability came to him through many years of being a doctor and having to deal with stress and not always completely honest patients and relative of patients. Which was stupid because how was he supposed to treat people properly if they didn't tell him the truth about their symptoms and stuff? That's what you go. Yes. That's what you go. Yeah, I that's what you go. Like all the editorializing with this fucking chat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nance pronounced ponderously and with emphasis. Your father. Tell me, Miss Stevens. What can you tell me about your father? Irene sat quietly for a minute and thought. Finally, she raised one perfectly golden arch eyebrow and answered, Not a lot, really. It was always sort of this that when I was growing up. He only really noticed me if I was bad, and then he only noticed enough to punish me. He was a real bucka. I suppose you could <laughs> say that's why I made a lot of the choices I made. Why I wound up the way I did. A lot of choices she made, like now. gargling glass as a kid. <laughs> she saw Oh, Abaka Desu! Did she become a weeb, though? I don't understand. <laughs> this whole chapter is a weeb! <laughs> she sighed, which made her already impressive cleavage try to leap for freedom out of the linen blend prison <laughs> her suit jacket. I'm getting out of here! <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, hold on a bit. I think this is worth what? obviously digging up the webcam for. Oh no. <laughs> I understood all of that. <laughs> Switch the fucking voiceover psych. Like what? Like please no. <laughs> please switch the voiceover. <laughs> 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 All right, and briefly made Archer and Nance forget completely about what was he going to say next. But then he remembered. Well, Miss Stevens, I had a reason. I have reason to believe that he was involved with a friend of your late. He paused, trying to think of a delicate way to put this, and then giving up because there wasn't really any delicate way to put it. Your late boyfriend, Mister Archer. You don't like that little forward, Harry. <laughs> Irene explained. I'm sorry, what? Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Is a demon just spurting out of her slowly as this chapter goes on? <laughs> I guess. Irene exclaimed, jumping to her feet and looking alarmed in a way that Harcher didn't have to be a detective or a doctor to even someone who played one on TV to be able to figure out. It was that obvious. <laughs> no. Is that obvious? No, my dear. I didn't say that. I said he was involved with one of Mr. Archer's friend. He stressed. A friend by the name of... Rory... A friend by the name of... What? <laughs> Rory Edwards. There was a silence, and all you could hear was the beep-beep of hospital <laughs> machines. <laughs> <laughs> they suddenly made I've been to the hospital, <laughs> that's really all it is. Just beep-beep, 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 beep-beep. This suddenly made Nance realize that the office door was open, because otherwise he couldn't have heard the machine, and he rushed hastily over to close it, thinking, Shit! What if someone heard that? What if Bruce Lucent heard it? Of course, he hadn't gotten to the part that involved Bruce yet, but what if the brilliant young software designer had heard and had somehow made the connections? Even though Nance himself wasn't sure what he suspected was anything more than the flimsiest of tissue paper rumor, that, Nancy, 
thought grimly to himself would be a very, very bad day. Meantime, Irene's already porcelain pale complexion had gone completely dead white. She repeated through lips. <laughs> oh, no. are, are you even trying anymore? <laughs> no, I'm not. Like when you go to the dentist and the Novocaine gets shot into not quite the right spot. Yes, stayed a nonce, shutting the door with a melodramatic click. Click! And there's more. <laughs> more? Repeated Hyrene, sinking back down into her chair. More, Nance confirmed. <laughs> this is what makes it all so suspicious, you see. <laughs> yeah, I can see! You will, because Rory was in cahoots the whole time with Isidore Trent! What?! shrieked Hyrene. That stupid, gender confused ponytail freak! <laughs> because, She's yeah. had 85 voices in this chapter. <laughs> but yeah, the reason why they say gender confused was because, well, Isidore Trent started out as a guy in the novel and suddenly right. became a girl with no good reason. <laughs> okay. Does there need to be a good reason? Let's be real. Yeah, but hmm. somehow now they address Literally it nothing in, in this has happened for a good reason. <laughs> yeah. Henry's alive again, apparently, judging by the last... <laughs> well, I'm sorry I drank so much more TDs that I had a whole bunch of girls perform sex, but I didn't mean it. <laughs> Alright, now... There was so much sex being performed. Now, now, Nance Chida, that's no way to talk about someone. Isadora may have had some issues, but she's a person just like anyone else. Pause and his chocolate brown eyes glazed over with memory as he remembered another person so very long ago who had the same issues and had been so cruelly taken away from him because of them. Young people could be so cruel, especially young people still in school and surrounded by such incredible pressure to belong, conform, fit in with a group, any group, just as long as they could say they fit in somewhere. So Irene had folded her arm under a perfect melon-shaped press and was glaring at him. Nance forced his mind back to the present and continued. This is what makes it all so damn suspicious, you see. Two men. One dies in a car crash. One survives a car crash. Each has a friend. Bruce's friend is Isidore. And Henry's friend is Rory. And a common person they each know. Your father, Irene. Isaac Stevens. The one meeting point of all this crazy insanity. There is more going on than you could possibly guess. And your father was right there in the thick of it. Connected to Isidore and Rory. Do we have any proof of any of this? Irene hissed, glaring at the doctor with hate quivering in her cerulean eyes. Just the doctor tears out his fucking corkboard. It's completely full of pictures and string and thumbtack. <laughs> That's not important. What's important is that we learn the truth. Proof can come later. <laughs> um. <laughs> yep. 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 Sure. Yep. That's only how we learn the truth by making up facts. We're arguing up pretty more of it! What about you, Mr. Nance? You treated upon Henry Bruce! One of them lived, the other one didn't! How do I know you aren't the common point connecting at all? It's like he did not go to six years of med school for you to call him Mr. Nance. <laughs> <laughs> Irene, you know that isn't true, Armour murmured gently. I'm a doctor. My mission is only to heal. I only want to learn the truth. Not hurt anyone. Suddenly, Hyrene burst into tears, flinging herself against Archer's manly chest and burrowing into its strength. I'm sorry! She cried between some. I, I just didn't want to believe it! Please! What are we going to do? We'll do what we have to, declared Nance, whose mind was now racing even as he held the sobbing young girl in his solid-toned arm. Already was beginning to formulate a plan. It was a crazy plan, but he thought it might have a chance of working. And if it did work, 
then everything will fall into place, like a house of cards collapsing when you pull just one card too many on top of the fragile structure. We'll figure <laughs> out the truth. Yep. The <laughs> truth. The truth. <laughs> All right, chapter 39. Who wants to take MC? it? MC? Oh, I guess it is. Come on, MC. I don't know how to read this word. Cre crepuscular? <laughs> Trip, 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 good enough, yeah. Crepuscular sound. Yeah, a, a gray crepuscular light speed stripe, stripily. Hold on. No, it's it's stripily. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, it's a crepuscular. <laughs> a, a gray crisp. A, 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 a gray. Uh, a great, great crepuscular, crepuscular light seep Bruce down Wayne onto down onto Bruce's face. He blinked and yawned. What's happening? He murmured, rolling over to to hug his pillow. His pillow. What happened to his pillow? It was no longer his hypoallergenic polyester fiber fill king sized favorite. This was a half sized foam rubber hockey puck. <laughs> <laughs> Reflexively, <laughs> Bruce sat up and was suddenly abruptly filled half halfway up like an oak tree by a sharp blow to the forehead. He lay back, stunned and rubbing the rapidly swelling red lump above his left eyebrow. The ceiling had dropped. It was now thirty inches above his face, a concrete ceiling crossing by crossed by steel girders. It was a steel girder he he had hit his head on. From directly below him, a deep voice growled, Shut up, prison bride, or I'll smack you till you do, huh? From, from slightly further below, Bruce had a good ear. An even deeper voice snarled, Lay off your fucking noise, you fucking motherfuckers. It's five fucking a.m. <laughs> Bruce lay very still, <laughs> trembling. <laughs> what happened? Who were the who were these people in his bedroom? Rolling only his eyes around the room, he took in his surroundings. His comfortable bedroom had changed horribly. A barred window through which a tiny slice of gelid dawn sky peeped. Concrete block walls, concrete floor, concrete ceiling painted shiny gray and adorned with graffiti in many colors. Without comprehension, his eye took in the scrawl on the ceiling above his bed. In an indelible blue magic marker, the num the num survived all the hard words on my chapter. Trilogue resolved into the inscription. Was it? Could it be? Had everything been a dream? I don't feel very fortunate. Bruce complained as his friend as his friend helped him from the low slung red car I heard all over. And I don't remember a thing after I left that bar over on Martin Avenue. I wouldn't be surprised if the police didn't want to talk to me about what happened. Not that I could help them because I don't remember anything, he added as an afterthought. This only happens in Dallas, Bruce told himself, whimpering silently in the back of his throat. What was this place? He lay on a metal bunk with a thin mattress almost nine feet above the air, above the floor. A bunk from which ominous creaks and shakings began to emerge. Like Moby Dick rising from the ocean depths, a shaven dead white skull slowly ascended above the horizon of his bunk. You fucker. This vision intoned, scowling. I was asleep. I was dreaming about little Maddie. I was warming her baby bottle in the microwave. And you, you fucker, you fucking woke me up. One look into the into those crazy green eyes, and Bruce knew he was in the presence of a maniac. A genuine deluxe homicidal maniac. Little Maddie or no. <laughs> uh, and the size and color of an albino catcher's mitt rose into view and moved inexorably towards his throat. Bruce shrank back in the narrow bunk, clutching his thin, scratchy brown blanket. 
and pressing himself hopelessly against the cold, unforgiving concrete block at his back. Conversation. That was the ticket. Cordial conversation on topics of mutual interest. Is this Jay and I quaver? <laughs> it's fucking <laughs> death row, <Uno>. motherfucker! <laughs> the great white whale snarled. <laughs> and, you <What>? know what, <laughs> and you know what that means. It means that fucking waste. And there ain't no, and there ain't nothing that you th- can do to me no, no more. I'm like a desperate man. If you take my me. His ham like can clamped inexorably around the neck of Bruce's pajama top. Bruce was dragged headfirst out of the bunk and dropped like a dead fish onto the floor. Luckily, he was still clutching his foam rubber pillow, which broke the impact of the. Right in front of his nose, the great white's pallid bare feet seemed with corns and wrinkles from too tight athletic shoes <laughs> seemed to be the size of canoes. God damn it. Bodine. Suddenly a pair of large flat feet, black as shoe polish, like slapped shoe down polish. <laughs> slapped down <laughs> onto the it's floor. Really black. <laughs> the occupant of the middle bunk had entered the fray. Can't we go one single goddamn night without a scrap, huh? There was a solid meaty sound. The sound of solid dark meat hitting bony <laughs> muscle. Bruce curled up small, hoping not to be stepped on. Fuck it. You think just because you got in 20 fucking counts of serial rape and murder that you such fucking hot stuff? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. A lot of counts. <laughs> they keep on telling us black folks we got oversized sex drives. So what's a man gonna do? Huh? The huge black <gasps> man glared down at Bruce. The throw is going to hell. Just like the goddamn United Nations. <laughs> Look yeah, at this yellow you. shit here. <laughs> what? It's all this affirmative action to believe. <laughs> oh, man. It's getting polite. Show you an oversized draft fucker. From this, from his vantage point on the floor, Bruce could see the homemade ship. Bodine, the whale was flashing, (laughs) pulled from his waistband. Suddenly, there came a clang of metal on metal from outside the cell. Chow call, folks. Chow call. The wardens were coming. Bruce sat up. Keys clanked. And doors opened one by one, nearer and nearer. Odin's shiv vanished like magic into the top of his sock. Okay. The barred door of their cell slid back with a resounding clang, and the black man and Bodine shuffled sullenly out. Bruce scrambled to his feet. Hey, man. This is all a dreadful mistake. I'm, you know, in this... The warden didn't even look at him. Save it for your lawyer, pal. I didn't kill Callie. Sure, pal. I'm for my first lady, Barbara Bush. Get a move on, will you? Please, I shouldn't be here. Bodine shot a look of contemptuous back over his shoulder at Bruce. And you know, little Mart, little Mad, that wasn't my fault. What? Wasn't that fucking two time and arrogant woman? Her mother, the razor blade, all her idea. Sure, Bruce said, his teeth chattering. He tottered rapidly along the in the line, single file, down several open riser steel staircases, and then down a long bare concrete corridor to the cafeteria. This was a cavernous, windowless basement space lit harshly by the pitiless glare of fluorescent lights. Its windows shielded by heavy grates. A haze of cigarette smoke hung bluely near the ceiling. The trays were press board, the utensils were plastic, and the plates were styrofoam. (laughs) He held out his tray, and a server in a hairnet plopped down a spoonful of something colorless swimming in greasy ichor. It was either grits or scrambled eggs. The coffee in styrofoam cups was tepid and so weak he could see the bottom of the cup. 
he had a sugar and coffee creamer to see if that would help. Was it better to sit with his cellmates or to find a, another table and hope that he wasn't joined by a child murderer or a serial rapist? Better the devils you know that the devils you don't, he decided. But I don't think... Whatever. But not too close and not too far. He chose a place at the further end of the huge black man's table. At least he seemed to be unarmed. His, his cog, cog, cognomen, cog, cognomen, seemed to be... <laughs> seemed to be Pericles. <laughs> and he was joined by a number of compatriots who lit cigarettes and rapidly scarfed down the food. Bruce could only pick at his own plate. Have to get out of here, he told himself. Have to t talk to my lawyer. We have to fight this all the way to the Supreme Court. Suddenly, Bodine sauntered up to the up to their table. First, I'm going to gut you like a fucking trout, he announced. Then I'm going to pound the little snot's head in for dessert. Pericles seemed unimpressed. You bore me, man. Bodine picked up Bruce's nearly untouched plate and threw it like a frisbee. Gray goop flew everywhere, but there was enough stuck on the plate. <laughs> there was enough stuck on that when the plate hit Pericles. It glopped down his t-shirt front. Without visible effort, Pericles picked up his chair and slung it at Bodine. All around, all around them, the other inmates stood up and yelled for blood. Plates, cups, chairs, and food flew through the air. Bruce prudently, aban <laughs> Bruce prudently abandoned his seat and crept under the table. I'm amazed at how much nothing happened in that yeah. fucking chapter. I mean, so Bruce cool. went to jail, apparently. That's, that's... <laughs> yeah, what happened to Callie when she died? Uh, I, don't it's know, just... I don't know. Yeah, it's Maybe just a, a dream. <laughs> Or is it a dream? It's deep, man. So, <laughs> Alright, so the end. Or is it chapter 40? Irene checked her face <laughs> in the 40. mirror and the gun in her handbag. Just How dare more. you skip my turn? <laughs> uh, wait, but didn't you already read? Oh, no, that's right. It's going, yeah, it's going UMC me. Yeah. Uh, that was where I'm reading. Uh, maybe it didn't. Hold on. Uh, no, actually, uh, yeah, you're you, right. It's you did, your you did chapter 38, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, you, you skipped ooze. How dare! <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> there's only two left. We got it. We got it. Yep. Chapter. <laughs> Irene checked her face in the mirror and the gun in her handbag just once more, but found she before she found the reserve she was looking for in herself. Popping in a fresh breath mint, just in case, she pushed open the boardroom door to confront the three people who had ruined her life and killed her love. I'm like, fucking God, I have three people here. Fuck this shit. Well, you gotta her have father. your breath smelling good if you're gonna murder people. Her father, Isaac Stevens, turned quickly, sloshing the whiskey, a wonderful single malt, from the glass. <laughs> Isaac was... <laughs> um... It's more... Uh, oh, no, that's right, Isaac Stevens. I don't know. That's what... Yeah. Uh, um, damn it, girl! I thought you were to knock when entering a room. All good women know that. Okay, I'm gonna try and do your art. Yes, for the right to go out and help. I'm gonna try to make the bad manners. I'm not to kill my best friend and my business partner. Then, like father, like daughter. <sighs> I'm just you trying to make sex get some voice here. <laughs> The other two people in the room took a sudden greater interest in this new conversation. Penelope and Rory stood too close for a casual chat, what? And the lipstick smears on Rory's face seemed to give rise to the evidence that the two had at least been quietly occupied as Isaac got celebratory uh, hmm. Yeah, that's why. Did Rory even have a Rory. voice? Rory. Has Rory, yeah, has Rory been in the story yet? Yeah. Did we just, like, hear about him? Yeah, we heard oh. about well, him, I know he'd but he heard about never it, but talks. Has he spoken before? Oh. Uh, whatever. 
Well, well, the little Mithy's gone and got herself into a little bit of a fit now, ain't she? Sniped Rory as he slipped his arm around Penelope's slim waist. What are you trying to say, gal? Irene suddenly realized that her plan to scare her father into confessing the attempted murder of Bruce and the accidental death of her lover Henry might have one or two flaws to it. She hadn't realized that all three had been plotting for this coup for months, and now she would just be one more little pretty speed bump on the road to riches. As this kernel of truth popped open, Irene reached into her purse to grab the gun, but strong feelings of misgiving began to overwhelm her. Could she shoot her father, the man who had raised her since her mother's untimely demise? Rory dropped his hold of the luscious Penelope's waist and lunged for Irene, sure that he, the big strong man that he was, could stop this tiny girl from do going or doing anything. His eyes gleamed evilly until suddenly they took on a look of surprise. The hand that had so recently been fondling Penelope's bosom, uh, besom, now clutched onto his own bleeding midsection as he dropped to his knees on the overly expensive Persian. She Not shot me. Rock. That she <laughs> shot me. That damn bitch daughter of Yorin shot me. <laughs> <laughs> and with that exclamation, he pitched face forward with an Nareen nudged his head with her perfectly pedicure right foot. He didn't seem to notice, so she figured he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good line good one less problem to worry me she thought uh let's see. who's who's i've already forgotten what voice i just gave oh yeah why didn't the hell do you think you're doing shouted isaac fear causing his voice to waver a bit now you've gone way beyond any manners they taught you at that fancy boarding school i sent you to you do not, you just do not shoot people, that's not right. So, thought Irene, this is what real power feels like. I like it. And with that thought, she raised the gun and pointed it at the remaining two. She waved the gun casually, between the two like a lazy band conductor in two-two time. No, father, tell me again how mother died in the car fire. You know, the one in which your brother was not really there. And how sorry you were that Henry, your oldest and dearest friend. Father of your grandson to me, I did the same little accident, and how they left you temporarily in charge of both of company. Oh, and one of how many months did it take time to come? Did you enjoy my dad? What is it with you and these old rich bastards? Bastard D. <laughs> Actually, you were much more fun, sweetie. These old guys just can't measure up. Remember that trip to the Bahamas, that beach? Penelope slowly moved forward with each word, distancing herself from Isaac. We sure rocked that world! I'll never forget how you said we should never come back to Atlanta, and how we should live there forever on your chest fund. Penelope reached a hand out to Irene and tried to reach out and stroke her cheek. Forget the Bahamas, bitch! <laughs> Irene slapped Penelope's hand away. <laughs> you left me there to rot next to I knew I was paying bail and bribes for some stolen jewelry. And damn it, I didn't even enjoy any of it! Irene spit the words into Penelope's face as the gun split three rounds into her gut. I was going to die a piece of time. One bullet for each day I spent in jail from you. That's all you ever get from me. We need baby, sweetheart. <laughs> now let's show your daddy. We can come to an understanding, can't we? Isaac sniveled as he dropped to his knees in front of his daughter. Don't call me that. You ain't got no rights to use mama's name for me. <laughs> Irene's accent, tore, Irene's accent tore through as her tears began to fall. <laughs> Daddy, I don't want to kill you, but if you don't die, then we all just find a way to get over here in the babies. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't die. Uh, no, honey, give me a chance. We can fix all this up in no time. We'll keep up to the plan and take the company, and then feel and feel Bruce will never figure it out. It was us until we're off living the good life in Europe with his money. I was there with you. I control the company and most of the shares, so we can have it all and be gone in a week. So please don't shoot me. Isaac crawled toward his daughter, pleading for his life and thinking that he could get the gun away when the other two fools couldn't. Fuck off, honor. Die like a man, not the crawling worm I've come to know. <laughs> 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 Two more, tore yeah. Two more shots tore yeah. Two more shots tore through the carpet. Isaac cowered down his hands over his head and began to shake. Two more Iron shots tore out the carpet. Out the carpet. Iron spoon. Well daddy, this is his goodbye. Kiss kiss, hugs, ta ta. <laughs> One more shot rang out, and Isaac's very expensive toupee took a wild leap from his now bald and bleeding head. Yep. Irene 
sat back to take in their handiwork. Three very dead bodies lay around the room, each with a different expression on what was left of their respective faces. Irene noticed a smudge of blood on the tip of her toe and bent down to wipe it off. She used the hanky from Rory's breast pocket, as he no longer needed it. Bruce rolled into Bruce rolled into the room. <laughs> Great work, my love! I'll have my people clean this up and we need never bother with this again. Now go get cleaned up. We have a meeting of the board of directors in an hour, and I need my new senior VP ready to shine. I'll see you in ten, babe. Got those tickets ready for Barcelona. <laughs> sure do. And then three weeks on the French Riviera. Then pop home and get the nursery ready for our boys. Isn't life great when you got all the money and no scruples? Then they laughed as they left the gory scene to the cleanup crew. <laughs> What the fuck was that chapter? God, it's it's just like the end of like an 80s cartoon. Everybody laughing. Lesson <laughs> learned. But wait, there's one more chapter. Yep, yep. But... chapter 41. Right, so I can really rush to that one. All right. Insert Richard Isaacs. Outside, below, so far, Atlanta, teeming Herbin's Prawl, Boeings and Learjets circling like buzzers, to the corporate stink of carrion, cruising hot turmoil of greed. Whole jets never die, they just go into a holding pattern over Atlanta. Can it be that it's life itself that's the holding pattern? Makes you think. <laughs> Somewhere out there, misted by the steamy fog of his heated breath on the cool air conditioned glass, Margaret Eastman's curve filled a tight squist. The tight stretched Spandex City with their silicone bounty. Shouldn't that be enough to live for? Shouldn't it? Shouldn't it? Not if he couldn't have her. Inside the ghostly reflection of the office window, the shadow of a man, Richard Isaacs, superimposed on the crawling sea, a giant over an anthill. No, the problem is the Discord server, voice server. Yeah, yeah, I figured it was. Yep. Wasn't gonna fix. I, you can fix it, change, like... If only we could change oh. channels, but that's impossible. <laughs> yeah, if only we could, we could change. The voice server, like through the server settings or something. Yeah, let me fall. see. Uh, ah, but then I have. Is there like any other server I could try because it's just like, oh, I have USS. Uh, USS. Uh, go, go for Central. All right, I guess. Let's try Central. All right, careful. You have unsafe changes. All right, so I guess let's all log in and, all, and out and everything. No, you yeah. don't need to log in and out. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so... Does it Sounds have... better. Ah, oh, okay, so it's I guess... It's a miracle. All right. Thank you, uh, U.S. Continue. East. But I guess in memory of the last Discord server, we better continue the reading the same way. A giant yeah. ready to lay down on that hand hill and pour honey on itself and let it heat he him alive. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> like it hadn't already tried. How far he'd grown from little Richie Isaacs, the kid everyone loved to pick on, the kid who stole a bag of apples from the teacher from the tree in the Johnson's yard, the kid who nobody ever knew put the rocks in Mr. Miller's garden hose, or the Kool-Aid in the <laughs> principal's gas tank, or the, call pr the prank calls to random name in the phone book to ask if the bowels were there, or did they move? Oh, he was a tricky little devil. Nobody ever put one over little Richie Isaacs. How did it all come to this? Was it the abuse of the priest at the first Baptist church with the red silk cossack around his neck announcing his corrupt virtue for no one to see? Was it Pop taking the belt to him between belts from Quart Ball of Rheingold? Was it Uncle Jeb turning into the driveway to pulverize his beloved Lionel trains under the cruel wheels of the whole John Deere? Was it Ma on the creaky porch in her frumpy house drift and pink slippers and curlers sipping mint juleps like there was no care in all the world? Oh, mama, he thought sadly. I'm so sorry I never went to your funeral. How did it ever come to this for Mrs. Isaac's best baby boy? 
A well-built man surveyed an off his office environs in a reverie that was so uncharacteristic for him. The designer of furniture that looked like they carved it from the iceberg that sank the Titanic. The abstract impressionist original on the wall that he always took thought looked like head what's his name from the movie version. The bank of TV screens showing MSNBC, the financial feeds, the antique globe he liked to spin and trail his finger over it to get a tactical sensation of the mountains and the valleys rising and falling like a graph of today's Dow. His fingers. His fingers. <laughs> Looking at his hands, the back of which were beginning to show age spots like rust. Ruts. Uh, rust, I mean. Which forms not on peach trees, not on living growing things. Things that soak up the king putrid, putrid soil and drank lemony sunlight and gave back the breath of life, but rather rust which forms on iron. Things of cold and metal hardness. Richard's finger were perversely aware of the power they had to manipulate, to mold force with their high and cold metal harness, the objects of their will and the directions they willed them. A few taps on these fingertips on the right keys on the right board at the right moment, lives were ruined. Buy low, sell high. Everything has a price. Richard Isaacs was higher than he knew, holding the metaphor in his palms, all the blood drained from his sanguine face. His hands could kill. Him. His hands could kill him. Ye gods, what terrible power! Should he do it? Wondered. It wasn't like the motivation wasn't non-existent. Despair was kudzu. Choking, creeping, ravenous kudzu. Nothing to do but to napalm it. You had your bull markets of the soul and bear markets. Crashes and depressions. And he wasn't talking about the kind of crash Bruce Lucent lost his shorts in. Sometime, one had no choice but to realize the loss. <laughs> what a scene, <laughs> Thank you, Nolati, for the bits. <laughs> Thank you. My novel is ruined, unless I go to crusty novels in order to fix it. Delightfully <laughs> devilish. Sometime, a guy had to take the cosmic ta tax deduction in the sky. You didn't always get an option or a choice or other uh, alternative could be hit. The big correction. All umpteen shrieking stories. It was not to be. Damn sealed glass. Damn climate control. Damn transparent prison. Or maybe a phone cord around the neck, he reflected. However, there was nowhere to hang from in this sterile, plastic, state-of-the-art, environmentally correct, eco-friendly cage. Goddamn Euro trash designers claimed they thought of everything, but they didn't think of this now, did they? Space didn't have every modern amenity. Couldn't gas yourself in a general electric microwave. Then suppose he could buzz down on the lobby and request a halfway decent sprinkler head to hang his sorry gullet on. But couldn't you rig something through the cord? Twist a ruler to it? Couldn't you tighten it yourself? Turning and torquing and winding, tighter and tighter, muscles straining in his merciless shoulder, cranking a bulwark close on a sinking ship. Would he have the balls to go through with it? Ring the breath from his own gasping throat? Will he plead for his life? Will he say, Dick, for Dick, for God's sake, don't do this. You have so much to live for. Don't be a fool. Don't throw your life away. Woohoo. <laughs> Will those hands, his iron hands, his terrible, aging, rust corroded, sin stained hands take on their own Doctor Strange Lovian's personality? Could nothing he say deter them from their inexorable will? He wrestled his Stygian herge down with Herculean aplomb. Got a hold of himself. Control. Control he could do. All right. No Dopplering.com plummet to eat a terminal snack of pigeon-flavored pavement after the dead cat bounce. No jolt of autocratic asphyxiation, wrenching the Aphex dead eye ruler the way he wrenched himself in the wee of the night when he lay prostate on his back and no one could hear him ejaculate <laughs> Margaret's name <laughs> into the sealy cerebral mattress drenched with the carnal effluent of desires. <laughs> no tragic, grandiose flinging of the bell south fiber, optic wiring over the rafter. Fiber equals optic. 
since there wasn't one. Positioning the semperfidic ergonomic office chair, looping the Jimi Hendrix official handmade collectible silk necktie neck, kicking the spinning chair across the anti-static mat, cleated like Beckham soccer shoes. Beckham! David Beckham! <laughs> Booted like Beckham! Yep. <laughs> To the migraine millikin carpet, kicking the climate control hair with its direction adjustable hypoallergenic louvers, kicking the generic afterlife. There was always Valium. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> there was always Valium. When you can't hang yourself, there's always Valium. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Stumbling to the kidney-shaped translucency iceberg, the green designer desk, the bottles came into his iron hands like magnets snapping into iron. Valium, Zolov, Privacid, Lescol, Xenocol, Zantac, uh, Paxil, Ultram, The War. I'm gonna fucking OD on Zolov, that sounds good. Yeah. Before he knew it. The stock ticker of his life will be passing before his eyes. <laughs> then sweet oblivion. Glorious nothingness. No more torturous silicone vision. No more danger sharp curves ahead. No more Bruce Lucent and his infernal reeking testosterone. <laughs> Making yeah, a man fucking bathe, Bruce. <laughs> Making a man want Take to a be shower. Things no decent man ought to be. Ought to want to be and do things no decent man how to want to do. No more onus of law enforcement feated bread ought under his collar. Fetid, but yeah. Yeah. No more ratting. No more backstabbing. No more megalomaniac Machiavellian machinations. No more No, Margaret. that's a good line, though. No more Black Fridays. No more blow-off blow tops. No more crack spreads. No more drunkard walks. No more high-ticking. No more LEEPs. No more margin calls. No more market timing. No more mental stop loss. No more momentum indicator. No more multiple linear regressions. No more opportunity costs. No more outside reversal mods. No more pessimistic rate of return. No more pivot points. No more probability density function. No more quarterly net profit margin. No more relative return standard deviation. No more resistance line. No more shape candlesticks, no more spikes, no more splines, no more whip lashes, no more whip saws, no more hop swings, no more down swings, no more, 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 no, no, yes, no, he did not give up that easy. He was a commodity traded on his own future exchange. He will die before he sold himself that short. He was almost jig out there, almost whacked, almost melted his own account. But Richard Isaacs was not done yet. Richard Isaacs did not go down that easy. Richard Isaacs was a market maker. Richard Isaacs was printing on the hoe. He slung the handful of pills in an overhand hark toward the direction of the designer wastebasket, watching them soar through the luminous light of the Ptolemy's world classic omnidirectional task light. Hear them scatter like shotgun shot into the lacquer executive wastebasket, with the little bar graph decorated on it, the pinnacle of all his superficial aspirations, the symbol for his nearly untimely fall. Richard Isaacs returned to the window again. Dick Isaacs looked through his reflection. No one looked back. No one ever did. Outside, the cruel, uncaring metropolis, the juggernaut he will bring to its knees. Inside, Richard Isaacs. The end. The end. <laughs> what a beautiful, beautiful story. Yep. <laughs> But that's what the uh, fuck I still happened? think chapter 40 will have been the best ending. <laughs> it was a good ass ending, and I think that's why they didn't end with it. Yeah, because it was like, nah, that that would have made it look purpose purposefully bad good. So let's just end with a fucking wit fart. Well, we had to figure out what happened to Richard. <laughs> yeah, we had to learn about Richard wanting to commit suicide. Yeah, with all of the antidepressants that world had made, all in <laughs> one convenient office. <laughs> all right. So, oh, anyway, sure. what now, what now? 
So I'm, I'm, hi I'm hijacking about... the stream. What? What do you do? Time to read Garfield in the City by Shakespeare Hemingway. Yeah! Is that an I actual... love Shakespeare Hemingway! Is that an actual thing that exists? Yes! Garfield in the yes. City by Shakespeare Hemingway! Okay. It was a rainy day when Carrie was going uh, wait, shopping wait, wait, for wait, shoes wait, and wait, 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 okay, wait, okay. wait, wait. I need to get it up. So, alright, mm -hmm. Garfield? Shakespeare Hemingway, Garfield stuff That's is good shit. <laughs> okay, get... Okay, so Garfield, Shakespeare, Hemingway? Yes. Okay, alright, let's God, see. God, I fucking love Shakespeare got Hemingway, shit. dude. I got this shit. It's time. It's gonna wait uh, till it's. Okay, I'll wait till it's on your stream. Okay, so which one of the of them are you reading? I'm doing. I'm just doing this one. Shakespeare Hemingway, Garfield in the City. Okay. Because... I posted the link to it in the. I posted the link to it. Ah, oh, 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 yeah, Garfield in the City. <laughs> All right, hold on a bit. There, uh, we need. All right. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are you having a problem, Psych? Yeah, I'm having some uh, tiny wee bit All problems. Right. Garfield in the city. It was a rainy day when Carrie was going shopping for shoes and clothes in women's store when she ran into her friend Samantha. Samantha, I wish I would meet a man. I am lonely and useless alone, said Carrie with sad voice. It is okay. I am sure you will one day meet handsome man to sweep you off your feet for romance, said Samantha with consolation. I hope so, or I will cry and cry until tomorrow is gone and yesterday is here, said Samantha with sadness. <laughs> Samantha, <laughs> Samantha saw a flock of men and knew it was time for hunt. I must go hunt oh. men for sex, said Samantha with sass and liberation. <laughs> you are a spunky free spirit, said Carrie with admiration. You are a spunky and free too. Believe in your strength, said Samantha as she went off to find men. Ah, okay, Carrie can... Carrie continued her shopping and bought many shoes and clothes, including one with poodles on it. Clothes are the best, Carrie said, giving the cashier a thumbs up and a high five. As Carrie walked out, the rain had miraculously stopped like magic, and sun was shining in the air like rainbows in July. Something magical was surely happening. What is that? said Carrie, astonished as she saw the most amazing sight of her life. It was the most handsomest man she ever saw. He was full of muscles and masculinity. The man of might strolled up to Carrie with manly strut and ground quaked in his path. <laughs> Hello, what? what is my name? I'm Garfield. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, what is my name? Name, I am Garfield. What is my name? I am Garfield, said he <laughs> with moving <laughs> voice. Hi, I'm Samantha, You're the manliest man I've ever seen, said Samantha with blushing. I know, said Garfield with response. Let us go to dinner for eating now. Okay, said Samantha. Samantha and Garfield went to a very expensive restaurant with world-class food. What do you do, Garfield? asked Samantha. I am hotshot executive slash male model, responded Garfield with truth. While Garfield and Samantha were chatting it up, a waiter approached them. What will you be having today, said the waiter with courteous. I will have lasagna special, extra large, said Garfield with command. I'm sorry, we're all out of lasagna, said the waiter with foolish stupidity. <laughs> then go out and get some, said Garfield as he grabbed the waiter's collar and slammed him into the ground. <laughs> yes, sir, said the waiter, running away like little baby girl. Garfield, you are so manly. You must come back to my place for drinks and lovemaking, said Carrie with adoration. Yes, but first I must eat my lasagna, said Garfield as he sat back with relaxation. The waiter soon returned with lasagna, and Garfield ate all the lasagna with the fury of a raging comet. After Garfield ate all there was, the waiter returned to get the payments. That will be $40, said the waiter. I have so much money and can pay with ease, but I will not because you were late, said Garfield as he pushed down the waiter and poured his drink on him. Gar <laughs> Garfield and Carrie then waltzed out and saw Charlotte with her baby. Wow, you must be Garfield, the manliest man, said Charlotte. Yes, that baby is ugly, said Garfield, pointing at the baby. <laughs> yes, I would like to make some more attractive baby with you, Garfield, said Charlotte with beaming eyes. Maybe some other time right now I'm going to go make berries with Carrie, said Garfield with slyly. Okay, but call me sometime and I will give you body pleasure like no other, said Charlotte, licking her lips. <laughs> Garfield and Carrie then walked over to Carrie's apartment where they could have intimate relations. When they entered the apartment, Carrie put on mood music and then poured them drinks. To us, said Carrie. I would like more lasagna, said Garfield, said with impatience. Okay, we'll make you some, said Carrie with dutifulness. Carrie went into the kitchen and made a bash of special homemade lasagna just for Garfield. Here you are, Garfield, said Carrie with tenderness. Thank you, but you should be quicker next time, said Garfield as he took the lasagna and ate it all. You eat lasagna very sexily, said Carrie with admiration. Yep. Thank you. Next I will eat you inside and out, said Garfield. <laughs> also, he eats lasagna very sexily, but he just eats like... <laughs> <laughs>
Come with me, said Carrie as she led Garfield into her bedroom for romance. Garfield laid on the bed and Carrie pounced on him like Panther on the hunt. Give me all your loving, spare me none, said Garfield with lust. I will give you sex with cosmic force, said Garfield with roar. <laughs> Garfield serviced her with love for what felt like eternity, rocking her world. You are unreal, said Carrie with astonishment and exhaustion. Let's go to bed, said Garfield with good advice. Garfield and Carrie lay in their bed to relax and recharge their sexualities. Carrie then, however, rolled over to the table to get a knife. Upon hearing wrestling, Garfield reached under his pillow, grabbing his desert eagle, and shot <laughs> Carrie on the spot, making her roll on the floor. Garfield then stood over her with pointing gun. Garfield, how did you know I was Cylon? Said <laughs> Carrie with shock. I can smell Cylon like a fish in the water, said Garfield with cool style. You're too much for me, Garfield, said Carrie with a sigh. Yes, now prepare to go to Cylon hell, Robo Toots. And while you're there, be sure to tell the devil I'm coming for him next, said Garfield with roaring justice as he shot Carrie again, blowing her head off. Garfield then holstered her gun and walked out, lighting a cigarette on the way. I sure could use some lasagna, said Garfield as he walked into the sunset. The end? The end. The yeah. end. No, it's not, because then we have another <laughs> thing. <Yeah. laughs> because I'm a moron. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I know that people absolutely... Uh, oh, all right. Well, that's said hold on a bit. I think we need to... Unfuck all of this and everything in order oh, to oh. make sure that it's gonna be all okay. So, why? Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, in the meantime, I'm gonna send you a link to the yeah. beautiful thing. Sure. All right, old. And then Torpo died. <laughs> <laughs> Garfield killed him. Oh no. Garfield, how did you know Torpo was Cylon? Because <laughs> I fucking eat lasagna like a sex fiend. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Oh. Alright, 500. Ah, okay. Oh. Fully, that should be okay. Why is this all on like colored paper with <laughs> faint ass typewriter? Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> it's fancy. Yeah. Uh, all right. Hopefully, this. Ah, shit. I think. Nah. I absolutely have to. Yep. All right. Uh, oops. Okay, 200%. All right, that should be oh. hopefully good enough. Wait, no, the pages are not even the same size. I what, know. What, what the what? fuck? All right, all right, let's zoom out. Looks like you got fucked. Yep, looks like you got fucked. Let's just keep it on the picture of the alligator here. <laughs> yeah, I alligator. mean, at this point, this is like the, the best possible. His uh, I guess his name's Chad. <laughs> Yeah, Chad, <laughs> us for meetings. <laughs> so yeah, 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 we're gonna read the good old thing, which is called "The High of Argon" by Jim Teas. So now, well, wait. First of all, I'm gonna stop the recording and splice this up into another <laughs> thing.